feet. We're going to get ready to worship God in this place. Amen? And if you're joining us online, I want to say good morning to you today as well. Join with us as we worship the King of Kings. And just get ready to prepare your hearts for his presence. Amen? Jesus, we love you. And we just come before you. We want to stand in your presence today. And we want to lift up your name. For you are worthy of all praise. Let all fear, all things be pushed to the side, God. For we lift you up above all those, God. And we set you in your rightful place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Say my fear. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
that you're here. We're glad that you're a part. If you've received one of our VIP bags and you have one of those uh, connection cards that's inside of it, fill that out. You can take it to the coffee bar and get a free drink um, after service if you haven't already done so. You can drop it out there or you can also place it in our giving baskets that are right here, our buckets. We have them up front and we have it back at the round table. You can be seated just for a few minutes. Um, when I'm speaking of the giving buckets, though, I just want to let you know that right now we're not passing them for giving. But that doesn't mean that we just pass the buck on giving as well. Okay, so we want to make sure that we remember that while we are here, we still be faithful, whether it's through our tithe and our offering or whether it's through LEAP, the LEAP Fund. Um, not, it's the Legacy Project. I don't know why I said LEAP. So build this house. We want to make sure that we are still being faithful to giving to that. And if you want any information, you're like, what's that? What's the Legacy Project for Build This House? Well, we have information pamphlets on the information table out in the lobby that you are more than welcome to gather those and just get some information how um, more to invest into the house of God and for what God is doing because we believe that here we're building a legacy, not for what we're doing right now, but for the ones that are to come into this house so that they have a legacy to leave behind of who God is and that it's better then than it was before. Just like David, you know, Solomon built a greater temple than David did. And that's because what David did is he prepared for, for all of that to be done. He stored up all those treasures so that in the day when Solomon came, he was able to build a great temple for the Lord. And that's what we're doing here is we are storing up treasures. We are preparing so that the next generation can do even more than what we ever have done before. So that's what a part of the Legacy Project is. Get some more information about it. Um, we appreciate your giving. And I really mean that. We appreciate your giving. We appreciate you challenging yourself to be faithful in hard times to still give your time. We appreciate to be faithful to still give above and beyond, whether it's an offering or to the youth or to the children or to be able to give into the Legacy Project and build this house. That you have still continued to be faithful. And let me tell you something. When you don't forsake God in the hardest of times is when he is with you the most. So today, if you want to give at any time, you are more than welcome. The giving buckets are up here at the corners of the stage, but we also have it back at the round table. We have tithe envelopes at every corner on the doors that you are more than welcome to grab um, and put there. Our pins have been sanitized for you. Everything's ready um, for you, as well as our giving kiosk out in the front. Um, we have that as well for you to be able to give if you want to just pay through um, the credit card or um, you want to do a check that way, you are more than welcome to do it. But again, this, the church doesn't exist without you and your support and your heart for God. It just doesn't. And so we want to tell you we appreciate you. Also, I want to let you know we have an awesome service next Sunday. Next Sunday is August 30th. It is going to be our nine-year anniversary next Sunday. We've been going at this for nine years, and we believe that still the best is yet to come. That God's still growing us, and he's still building us, and still preparing us. So come join us for our nine-year anniversary next week. We have the water baptism that's going to take place that week. Um, it's going to be pretty awesome. There is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. And you want to make sure, if you believe that God is speaking to your heart to be baptized, then go ahead and sign up. If you are a student that is eight, under 18 years of age, you have to have your parents' um, permission to do so and sign up and have your parents' name along with your name and a phone number um, on there. Make sure that when you come next Sunday, if you're being baptized, that you bring a change of clothes and a towel um, with you so that you're prepared for that. It's, it's going to be awesome. What better way to celebrate nine years than to baptize and show that representation of our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, amen. It's good, right? Amen. So um, the other things that I want to let you know about is on that Sunday, it is combined service next Sunday. So we have combined service where all, we are joining United all one and a quarter from every single one of the kids to every single adult is going to be in here, um, and we are excited for what God is going to do next Sunday through the baptism, through celebrating our anniversary, but most of all, through celebrating Him. Amen? Amen. Um, one last thing I want to let you know, if you are a volunteer who has signed up 
for helping out in the kids' ministry recently. Um, we have the volunteer board out there with the helping hands on it. If you are one who has just recently signed up for that, we have a volunteer training coming up on September 6th after church. So they will have lunch provided for you. It's a quick training that you will go through. They want to make sure that you are ready and prepared to surf back there. And we're excited for what God's going to do because eventually we're going to open the other rooms and get things prepared. But to do that, we have to have the volunteers to serve. And without your hands, we can't have this next generation trained. Amen? So we need you. So we want to just let you know, please come, be a part. And uh, on September 6th, be a part of that volunteer service. There will be more to uh, come about. If you have any questions, see um, Rebecca and Cassandra. Let them know, you know, what questions you have, and they will answer them and get them out um, to you. And we'll try to make sure that we have things prepared for you for that day, right? How's everybody doing today? Is everybody awake today? Because it really does not feel like it. I'm awake. And I'm ready to be here today. So let's go ahead and stand one more time as we get ready to just worship and get into his presence because that's what we're here for, right? Amen. You're not here to hear me talk about announcements. You're here to hear God speak to you and we're here for his presence. Amen? Amen. So let's join today as we just get ready to worship his name. Jesus, we celebrate you. And we honor you in this place. There's no one like you. And there's no one but you. And Jesus, we just right at this minute, every single one of us, stop our hearts from all the things that we could be thinking about or doing, God, right at this minute. We stop and we pause for you. Speak to us today. And I'm no longer. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me. 
verse that you chose to give your heart for us, to give your life for us, to pay the ultimate price for us. You chose, God, us to love. And we're thankful for that today. And there's no love, God, that's better than yours. And there's nowhere else, God, that we'd rather be than right here in your presence. May we push every bit of who we are to the side, God, and focus on you. Focus on your direction. Focus on your guidance. And focus on your word. And God, I pray every heart would be open, God, to hear what you have to say today. And that our lives would choose to be directed by you and nothing else. We desire you, we long for you, we hope for you, we believe in you, we trust in you, God, and most of all, we have faith in you that you will do what you have said you will do, and you will keep your promises, for your word is yes and amen. And we agree with it today. We love you, Jesus, in your name, amen. So thankful what God is doing. And just a, a quick reminder of just like worship. Just, these are our outward expressions of, of who he is. I've said it so many times and how we get so hyped about stuff. Like at the ball game and, and everybody's cheering. But when it comes to church, sometimes there's crickets. It's quiet. I think our praise should be louder than any kind of sport arena or anything. Should be way louder than anything else that we cheer on. The King of Kings should be louder than anything we cheer on. It's just who he is. And I know like sometimes people look and like, well, you know, raising your hands or, you know, because people ask those questions. It's just an act of surrender. God, I give you everything. I have nothing else to hold on to. I just need you. I just want you, and I want you alone. And listen, if you're new here today, we love you. You're blessed. You have value. We're so glad you're here. We thank you. Online, we love you. And uh, people watch all the time online. We're thankful. Thank you for giving. You know how many people give online and click the give, the give link online? We're so thankful that people support the local church. And, and what the local church is trying to do and what we're doing in our community and uh, the season we're in right now of giving out food, thousands of pounds of food a week right now. Uh, we don't know if we're coming or going on that each week, but we're just thankful in the times we have it that we can help serve our yeah. community. Yeah. Um, and somebody come up to me and said, listen, this is, a, you know, there's two churches in the north end of town. They, one does it once a month. You have to have all this information and lay out, you know, your, your, your ID and everything. And the other one's more of an emergency situation. There's nothing in this city that's what you're doing at all. There's not, there's not one that's just consistently trying to just give away everything and anything. And listen, I, you can't outgive God. That's right. You can't. He's so good. And he gives us the opportunity to give to others, which turns around and gives him the glory and the praise and the honor for what we have. It's just a big cycle that we're going through. We've been in this uh, season about being blessed and uh, these Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mountain, I'm telling you, it is right on the money. You're talking about a time where these followers and people that were kind of curious about who Jesus Christ was. And they follow him up the hillside. It said that the committed climbed. Those committed companions climbed. He didn't segregate who should climb. He just climbed and they followed. So if you don't follow, that's your own fault for not climbing. You can't blame nobody else. And he talks to them about these, these parables. And he's not parables, but these beatitudes. He talks to them about them and, and trying to tell them that they're blessed. But in all worst case scenarios, yeah, yeah. when it doesn't make sense, you're blessed. Yeah. When all hell breaks loose, you're blessed. Oh, right. When it doesn't look correct, you're blessed. Right. 
And they're looking for hope that this man was going to set them free from the hold of Rome. And he was, and still before he was going to the cross, he still had to correct it and say, it's bigger than what you think. I'm coming back. I need you to go to Jerusalem because something's about to happen. And we're sitting in the room right now, the local church, the birth of the church happened. And here we are today. And it's still today. It's still the same. The mission is still the same. The word of God doesn't change. Our methods will change. We talk about that all the time. But that message still is, it's still relevant. It's still the number one book ever sold. It still has hope. It still works. It's the word of God. It's the gospel. It's the good news. And you might think, well, where's the good news when I don't, when, when, when there's not good news? When my, when my doctor's report is bad news. When, when the news report is bad news. Where's good news? It's in the word of God. You're blessed through it. You're blessed through all kinds. You're blessed through the morning. You're blessed in your weakness. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. You're blessed. And you have to realize when you face situations that you're blessed. I wrote a few things down and it's a few. I'm going to read through some of these and we're going to just, I'm just going to kick it off. Uh, I'm going to do the New King James first just to give you the we're in verse 10 uh, in Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs are the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For, for, those, for theirs are the kingdom of God. When you're persecuted for your right standing. For theirs are the kingdom of God. I didn't, I didn't write this one down, Christy, and she does awesome back there in the media and keeps all the words and everything going, um, and we're thankful for everybody back there that, that helps and the sound and these young adults and teens that help us make sure that the online experience happens for people anywhere and everywhere. We're so thankful for it. I'm going to read it in the, in the Passion Translation, and I'm going to read it in the message. And I'm going to dig in this real quick. And then we're going to, we're going to share. If you're new, listen, we, God told us to hold for it. So we just all been sitting at, a, at, at some couches and just kind of talking and sharing the gospel. I don't know if it's been good for you, but I'm telling you it's been good for me. It's been so good to hear the different uh, perspectives. We, we all know the scripture we're going to use, but the, the angles we're using, God gives us in the moment or been studying privately. We don't go over and it's like, okay, this is what you're going to say. This, is, this isn't WWF or WWE. We're not going to preset this up for y'all fakers. It's not real. Just tell me. Um, wrestling. <laughs> but we don't preset this up. This, this stuff is just, it, it's genuine. It's organic. God just makes it happen. I love it. So in the, um, let's go into the uh, Passion Translation. How enriched you are when you bear the wounds of being persecuted for doing what is right. For that is when you experience the realm of heaven's kingdom. Jesus. We did a series a while back about scarred. And listen, it's all good. This thing can cut out. I'll scream. I'll scream. Uh, you know, when you give to build this house, that's why we're going to buy new microphones. <laughs> Just saying, put a little thing on there. Uh, when you have those wounds, those, those scars of persecution. And I wrote these things down from the past just to kind of remind some people that have them, and maybe it's new to you today. Don't be ashamed of your scars. They prove that wounded people, to wounded people, that healing is real. Let me say it one more time because my tongue was twisted. Don't be ashamed of your scars. They prove to wounded people that healing is real. When you can bear the scars of even being persecuted and stand strong in who God is for your right standing with God. And we've said this many times, all of us in the past, and it's just a great reminder, the enemy wants to define you by your scars, but Jesus wants to define you by his. 
He wants to hold you back and look look what happened. Remember that story, Jeff? Remember when you did that? It always defined you by your past. But Jesus says, I want to define you by mine. I died for you. You're healed. You're set free. You have a purpose. And see, when you're persecuted for, for your right standing with, with God, you can bear those scars and say, listen, I'm still standing. God's still good. I'm blessed. You can get through it. I got through it. You can get through it. We just... We, we just mirrored the image of who Christ is. He wants us to walk like him and live like him. And so we'll bear that. Let me read this in a message. I like reading them all. I like getting my mind all wrapped around it. You're blessed when you're committed to God. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. Then persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. Right. Starts getting, see, see, heaven and earth, they collide. It's the biggest battle of all time. When you live by the spirit, the flesh wants to fight. And it per, provokes persecution. Now, we're not doing this on purpose to provoke, trying to get on a soapbox and scream at somebody at ISU. We ain't doing stuff like that. But that person persecution should drive you deeper into the kingdom of God. It shouldn't cower you off somewhere else. It shouldn't take you and like, well, I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this is going to work out. See, Jesus is, he's towards the end of these beatitudes and he's starting to conclude this stuff about this blessed life. And I don't think after they climbed up there, they're like, oh, this is going to be good. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna figure out a way to get Rome up out of here. And everybody's getting hyped. And then he's like, listen, you're blessed when you're persecuted. Yeah. What? Yeah. Now, hold on. No, no. I'm blessed when I, when I kill those who persecute. No, no. No, no. You're blessed when you're persecuted. So they, they were thinking one way, oh, we're going to have a, we're going to get a, we're going to get a war going. We're going to take it over, get that kingdom of David back. We're going to represent the Jewish culture, we're going to... And he's like, no, it's bigger than that. And so Jesus is on this, on this move and telling them that this life to be blessed is sometimes led by suffering. If Jesus was trying to, right now, online, if, I wrote this down, if Jesus was trying to gain followers then he certainly would not have helped his chances by talking about this persecution. That's right. No influencer, no CEO, politician of today would ever say to you, follow me, I'll lead you towards persecution. Nobody in influence would be like, listen, come follow me, come be a part, come subscribe, come be a part of this. Man, if you do that, you're gonna get in some persecution. He, I don't know if he would have that many followers leading this way. However, Jesus tells the disciples that following him leads towards righteousness. And that righteousness will be met with opposition. Yet at the end of your days, rejoice and be glad. Because your reward is great in heaven. Rejoice and be glad. Be glad. See, the people, people have, that have been following God and even in the past have been victim to lies. Am I in the right room? Has anybody ever been persecuted? Okay. They've been victim to lies and persecution. This happened in the Bible a lot of times with some of the heroes. And if you're older, you sat in Sunday school and what you didn't realize is some of your Sunday school heroes were persecuted. And what we talk about, such as Daniel and Nehemiah and Jesus Christ himself, they knew persecution. And when Jesus spoke this, there was already persecution beforehand from the, great, the greats of the past. Like Moses and Samuel and Elijah and Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Malachi and John the Baptist. And Brandon and Jit, 
Like, let's get into it. Crystal, we can start naming names. You're going to get persecuted. It's part of it. Please don't expect that you say you're a Christian and nothing's going to happen to you. But I think this is what sets God apart in the reality of, of life itself. Is that Jesus was never about giving you the, um, the vision of living in a false reality. And that's why I think it's so hard for us to follow him because it's easy to follow the world because all they feed you is fake reality and what looks good. And here Jesus sets and he tells you the reality of it is, is this is going to be hard. The reality of it is, is people aren't going to like you. The reality of it is, is you aren't going to be the popular one. The reality of it is, is people are going to hurt you. The reality of it is, is life is going to be tough. And just because you say you love me doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and tribulations and difficult, to, difficult things to happen. Almost the opposite is the more you love me and the more you serve me, the more you're going to suffer. The more things are going to happen. And, and it's, it's so hard for us to sign up for that. I've heard so many people say that, you know, uh, following God is just too hard. This is too much. The more I follow him, the worse things get. And, and I want to tell you something. Number one, you have to realize that when you choose to follow God, you are not only just giving your heart to a king and, and telling him to be the Lord of all your life. You are enlisting in the army. And you have to realize that when you enlist in an army, you are preparing yourself for battle and war. And every day that we live is a spiritual battle. Well, love, listen, I don't want to follow Christ. I'd rather follow, listen, I'd rather, I'll say it like this, I'd rather follow Christ in the worst case scenario than not follow him in the best case scenario. Yeah, that's right. It's the truth, but I think the problem of it is, is we don't realize who we are. We fight every day against flesh and blood and principalities of darkness and rulers of kingdoms that are not ours. And we are literally children of God who have come into this army. I can remember when I was a kid singing, you know, I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. You're going to be persecuted when you're going to school. Things are going to happen when you make a stand and yes. you try to pray for your lunch. Somebody's going to try to say something crazy. You just got to stand because you're in the Lord's army. You're still fighting. Because isn't it funny that the enemy loves to twist yeah. the word of God and, and serving God even to the reality that, well, if I love God, that means that I'm blessed to the point that nothing should ever happen. That I should never struggle. And then what happens is when you do get to the tiniest struggle or something happens and somebody says something against you, you opt out real quick because the pressure you can't take because what happens is you are so blinded by the fact that serving God is, is hard work. It's but, hard work. It takes work and effort to do that. Yeah, but here's the thing, guys. It is rewarding. It is. It is so rewarding. And you got to realize this, that when persecution happens in your life for who you are, saying a Christian and you're right standing with them, that it's a spiritual battle more than anything else. If somebody comes at you and is getting at you, please, like Pastor Josh has said many times, do not put a face to the enemy. Note that it's a spiritual fight that you're fighting because flesh and spirit don't mix like water and oil. And you have to realize that, that what is coming out is something more of a spiritual matter than anything. And then if you get offended so easy and you start to act like them, then how shallow is your Christianity? then you're no different than what they were doing. You have to be strong. Let me read this real quick. Moses was ridiculed by an entire nation, even his own family at times. Samuel was rejected by the nation and at one point was fearful of his life. Elijah was hunted by a wicked queen Jezebel. Elisha was hunted down by an entire army. Jeremiah was in prison at the bottom of a muddy well. Daniel was a victim of jealous conspiracy and thrown into a lion's den. John the Baptist was beheaded for calling out the king for disobeying God's law. Jesus Christ himself went through 
agonizing pain and death because of our sins. These people were persecuted for standing up and being right. And so realize this today. You're not alone. But don't bow down. Jesus has given his disciples statements about what life in his kingdom looks like. And how it leads to joy and satisfaction in a way that they never experienced before. See, here's the problem. Many of our culture would see these statements as setbacks or woes. But Jesus calls them blessed. And it leads to a greater reward. What Matthew's trying to communicate in this verse is Jesus is telling his followers. Or if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. So he's, what he's trying to tell us is that you will be persecuted for your faithfulness, not for your foolishness. It's good. It's good. Opposite will come to the people of God based on the righteousness. This righteousness is not proud or arrogant, holier than thou sort of action. But instead, because of being like Jesus, this persecution will not, will be because simply they're different in a different sort of way. Not just different, but in a different sort of way. It's because they worship Jesus as the Messiah and they call him Lord. Do you know that they would consider them terrorists if they said they were followers of Christ and Christians? That wasn't a normal thing back then. When you said you were a Christian, you were, you were going against the establishment. Persecution came because they looked, because they took seriously and put into practice the teachings of Jesus. Do you put the practice, the teachings of what Jesus is saying? The disciples claimed there was no other name under heaven by which we were saved. And it was only through Jesus Christ. That's what we claim. They gathered together around teachings of the apostles and they broke bread and fellowship and they prayed. They helped. They followed Jesus' command to love their neighbor, to help the poor pursue righteousness and, and follow him. Jesus told his disciples the night he was being betrayed to expect to be hated because the world hates him. And if you were of the world, then the world wouldn't hate you. This may be a shock to some of us because there were people in the world who admired Jesus. Jesus, just like there are people today who admire him. There's people right now that admire Jesus. However, admiration for Jesus goes away when it comes down to things like salvation and Jesus alone. Living out a way Jesus, a way of Jesus when conflict with culture and other areas that go against the world. Those things go away. Christ is looking for this remnant to rise up. Not just because it's the name of our church, but he's literally looking for remnants of people. Look what's going on in our country. Look what's going on around our state and around our cities. He's looking for, you're going to get persecuted. Can I say something right there? God really spoke to me that persecution is a clash. And it's between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Babylon. It's always been the clash. We're in a new era right as we speak. We are in a clash right now. It's the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. And we're standing, we haven't seen anything yet. Not, not trying to freak everybody out, but America hasn't really seen persecution. Europe hasn't really seen, per come on. We haven't really seen persecution. And so even in the church, it's got so comfortable because we really haven't seen the persecution. We could be saying that we, perse we were persecuted personally, but corporately, we haven't really seen the persecution. Come on. I don't see anybody beheaded and putting their head on a pat platter lately. Like John the Baptist. It's because of our faith. It says that the fruit, we will suffer. It 
this is a fruit, God said we are forewarned to be forearmed. He said this is a forewarning to be forearmed. None of this makes sense, does it? How are you blessed being persecuted? Like nobody wants to be persecuted. Like, okay, everybody line up that wants to be persecuted. I'm here to persecute you today. You know what I mean? Nobody lines up for it. But see, I think sometimes people think they're persecuted. Yeah. I think sometimes people are not allowing God to heal their soul and heal some things in their mind. So when somebody comes up and says something, they take that as a persecution. When in reality, they just haven't allowed a healing to come into their soul and into their minds. Yeah. I want to read this real quick. Uh, it says, living for God. It's First Peter 4. I love this. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. Oh. As a result, they do not live the rest of their life, their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. I think we're standing at a crossroad. I think that he is trying to say that if you're really going to stand, you're really going to be persecuted, you need to let your sins go. That doesn't mean, okay, well, all my sins are gone now. No. Die daily of your sin. Die daily. Renew your mind every day in the Word of God. Amen? For we have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, Detestable idolatry. This is huge. They surprise. Listen. They are surprised that you do not join them in the reckless wild living. I'm sick of. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of living in a reckless wild living. You see everybody. You turn around. You can turn the TV on, and they're living in a reckless wild living. There's lust. There's child pornography. Come on. There's a lot of things going on. And some of them don't want to change. They don't want to go in the will of God. It's, they think it's too big. The, the road is narrow. They have to get up, give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel was preached. For this reason the gospel was preached, Brandon. Even to those who are not now dead. So that they might be judged according to the to human standards in regarding to the body, but living according to God in the regard of the spirit. Verse 7 in the message. Everything in this world is about to be wrapped up. So take nothing for granted. Stay wide awake in prayer. And God spoke to me and he said, there is a separation that's happening. There's a clash going on. There's a new era. We don't know what this looks like. We still don't know what all this looks like. But we know there, there is a clash that's going on between darkness and light. Yeah. Whether it's in the city, whether it's in, it's in the country, whether it's in other countries, continents, there is a clash going on between darkness and light. If we can stand for what we believe in by faith, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going to take place. Can you read, do me a favor? Can you read the Church of Samaria? Samaria? How do you say that? Yes. Smyrna. Smyrna. That's what I got. Well, then you go ahead because that, no, it was on my heart for you to read that. I already had Chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. Uh, and to the angel, the divine messenger of the church, the Smyrna right. These are the words of the first and the last absolute deity, the Son of God, who died and came to life again. I know your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich, and how you are blasphemed and slandered by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. They are Jews only by blood and do not believe and truly honor the God whom they claim to worship. Fear nothing, 
that you are about to suffer. Be aware that the evil is about the evil the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested in your faith, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful to the point of death if you must die for your faith, and I will give you the crown consisting of life. He who has an ear, let him hear and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God will not be hurt by the second death, the lake of fire. It's crazy that you brought that out because when I was studying this, the only thing that I could think of to write is, are we willing to crash this gospel into the structures of this world to make Jesus known and famous, even if it costs us our lives? Because I don't think we are. We, we do good. We do good. We get on social media. We do all that stuff. And we proclaim it. But what about when we're in front of people and actually have to live it? I mean, I, I think about this all the time, even for my own personal life. Um, I wrote this down, and this is just a quote that the Holy Spirit gave me this morning. Persecution is the indicator that you are on the right track when it comes to standing in righteousness and having the moral compass of the kingdom. It's the indicator. But what's the key word in that verse? What I love about it is it says fear. Go back to the part where it says fear nothing. What's that say exactly right there? Fear nothing that you are about to suffer. And something that the Lord spoke to me yesterday, I had my notes wrote out and I was just standing in the kitchen and the kids were all talking to me and I said, hold on, hold on, everybody be quiet. And I had to pull my notes back out and this is what God said. Fear is the biggest persecutor of your faith. Fear is the biggest persecutor of your faith. If you think about the word persecute, fear persistently, persistently cuts away our ability to serve God to our fullest capacity. Fear consistently cuts away our ability to serve God to our fullest capacity. I think our biggest persecution and problem right now where we stand is the fear of things to come. And the problem is that fear will overwhelm you to the point that you do not stand for what is right because it clouds the vision of what God is truly trying to do. And he just said it clearly in there, fear nothing that you are about to suffer. Be aware that the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. Fear is the greatest persecutor of your faith. It will literally come in to devour all the things that God has built up in you to cause you to not do what is right, whether it's fear of what people are going to say, whether it's fear of what's going to happen, whether it's fear of losing things, whether it's fear of death, whether it's fear of this, that, all these things. And something that I heard this week stuck out to me so heavy. And God began to speak to me, number one, that anything worth living for is worth fighting for and dying for. Anything worth living for is worth fighting for and dying for. And God began to speak to me that people want to live life not fighting for anything. I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to have to push through. I don't want to do this. A lot of people, what do we hear? I just want it to go away. I just want this to go away. I don't want to get disappointed. What if I get hurt? People who want to live life not fighting for anything live with dead man's goals. Dead man's goals are ones that only dead people can achieve. If you're in the grave, guess what? It's all over. Guess what? You don't have to worry about being disappointed if you're dead. You don't have to worry about fighting for anything when you die. But those are dead man's goals. They're only goals that can be achieved when somebody dies. But discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. So good. Discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. True life is only found in Christ. To live in him means facing disappointment, facing hurt, and not running away, but pressing 
He wanted all the Jews dead. And she sets a table right in the midst of her enemies. And Haman was making a, a noose for, for, for Mordecai to be killed. And for he wanted all the Jews. He, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe this whole nation out. And so he's persecuting. He's right by the king. And here's Esther. Now she's married to the king. And all of a sudden, he ha he's hung by his own noose. Eventually, the enemy's going to be hung by his own noose. And how Esther responded in persecution, and how Paul responded, and how John on the island ended up writing the revelation. They threw him in the island. They boiled him with water. You don't need to read the word of God. And how he responded and how we go, how are we going to respond in the midst? I think this is a, a warning. This is a forewarning to be forearmed. I really believe this is a forewarning to be for, forearmed. And how we respond in the midst of our last breath. Stephen, the, the first martyr, and they bring him up and they start stoning him and he sees heaven. Go to the next part of the scripture. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness sake. For they will see the kingdom of heaven. Stephen saw before he was even gone to another place. He, he said, forgive. And here's Stephen being stoned. If you can be stoned and say, forgive, forgive them. Please, Lord, forgive them. I don't know about you, but God's going to have to work on me a lot. If somebody starts stoning me, that's back then, but you know, there's, per, there's persecution stones, you know, that can be thrown at you. And so I think how we respond and how we react, and, and, and first and foremost, are you really in the Lord's army? Are, are you really taking your stand and, and being in Christ? And it's so funny because you, you talk about fear, you know, the opposite of fear is faith. So what's going to eat at you? Fear. What's going to do when you turn the TV on? Fear. What's going to happen when, oh my goodness, and my, my son's out there and he, I don't know what he's doing. He's on drugs. I don't have fear. You should say, you know what, God? I pray that you'll send a messenger his way and be at peace. Some of the, like I just tell Pastor Josh, some of the persecution 
people were, I mean, they were like beat up for their, to, to, to stand. Paul and Silas got the fool knocked out of them just, just for doing the right thing. And we're mad and offended if somebody says something wrong to us. We don't even know what persecution is. So we got to start tightening up and, and getting a strong stance about yourself when the words come in. Let it roll off like rain X. Quit being so petty. When somebody offends you so easily, you, you go into a hole and then you find the people that want to pet you and tell them all about it. Stand strong and courageous. Because when it really does get for real worse, and you know, like she said, there's not going to be no peace. The, 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 when they were saying peace on earth and goodwill to men, it was because Christ came on the scene. Peace was going to be dwelling inside the soul. No matter what we faced on the outside, yeah. I can still be at peace through persecution. Yeah. I can still have faith through persecution. Your words don't matter to me because you're not my source. So what you say don't affect me. It rolls right off of me. And what happens is, is we don't have it tough enough. And when somebody says something wrong, oh, you better believe. Somebody's going to put it on blast on social media. Or they're going to call those certain ones that will tickle their fancy. You're petty. And that's hard to just say that. But the reality is God's wanting people to strengthen up. And somebody's going to say something crazy. And then you're, you're automatically, you, you jump out of your middle chair, or your faith and your, your, the, the right standing with God. And you jump over there real fast. And as soon as you do, that's when the enemy wants to just get you right in the ribs. No, stay right there. Stay in your armor. Stay fully clothed in it. Don't jump out of it so you can take care of business. Guess what? Let God take care of business. He's the head of it all. We follow after him. We will be persecuted. We will fight this good fight. And it's a, it's a spiritual fight, guys. Like, there's people, let's just be real about it. There's people for real physically fighting for their, their faith. Yeah. Some in China. Some in other places. A couple years ago when ISIS was cutting heads off. Because they just said they were standing for Jesus. They said they were a Christian. And we would see little clips online. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa that's crazy. We said, like, we don't have an idea. And then we're real offended. When somebody just says one thing to us, we melt down. Oh, they don't like me anymore. Oh, I just don't like me Oh, why are they always getting at me? You're grown babies that need the bottle. Get off the net and let's grow up. Get some meat. Let's get some meat. Yeah, that's what it says. Does not the word of God say there's a time to drink the milk and there's a time to eat the meat? That's the, that's the reality. We've got to grow up and get strong in the Lord and courageous. That's what he's called us to do. I think that's what he was trying to do when he was like, let's climb up here. See, first of all, let's see who's going to climb first. Yeah. And then he's like, look, you're blessed at this. You're blessed at this. And they're like, well, hold on. I'm blessed when I'm mourning. I'm blessed when I'm persecuted. Why don't we just be blessed because we destroyed Rome? Why don't we be blessed because we got rid of this? He's like, that's not how it works. Because all this stuff will continue to happen in your life. Stuff will happen. Diseases will happen. Things will come about. You've got to be blessed in all areas of life and seasons. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 in the Passion Translation. It says, the seed sown on gravel represents the person who gladly hears the kingdom message, but his experience remains shallow. That's so good. Shortly after he hears it, troubles and persecutions come because of the kingdom message he received. Then he quickly falls away, for the truth didn't seep deeply into his heart. I think, I think one of the greatest struggles we have in the body of Christ is that we live shallow lives. Is that rough? I'm talking myself. Y'all hear me? So when I'm up here preaching, when we're all up here preaching, we ain't just talking to you. We're talking to ourselves too. I have to measure my well every day. Because I can cap off a lot of things in my own life with shallow thinking. Social media is shallow thinking. 
Are y'all hearing me? Because I don't know, I don't know why people are so intrigued by social media right now, but they are. And then when somebody even says anything remotely against you, you fall apart like your world just ended. And the crazy thing is, is you're hearing from people you don't even necessarily know. I got 600 friends on my Facebook page, and none of them are your friends. <laughs> but when they say something, you fall apart. Because you're more concerned about what they've got to say than who you were actually created to be. And so then we determine that to become persecution for our life when persecution has nothing to do with what they've said against you. Listen, I don't agree with everybody's political view. I think people are so consumed by politics right now that they have nothing to do with the kingdom. But you were just talking about it. But God just said to me, because it's easier to be addicted than committed. It's easier to be addicted than committed. Because an addiction is something that feeds you in a different way. But when you're committed, you have to strive to feed yourself. So good, love. And when you get into that kind of stuff, you are addicted to the things that are coming on. And it's like a source. It's something that's feeding you. And you don't have to go after it because it's easy to find all of that. But when you are committed, you have to climb and get to it. And the problem of it is, is we want to be addicted and not committed. Well, the struggle is, is when persecution really does come. What do you feed yourself every morning? If you're not feeding yourself the word, then you're not going to have the strength to overcome persecution. Right? If you're, listen, if y'all feeding yourself CNN and Fox News and all that crazy crap, I said crap, that's going on in this world right now, we are more concerned about our president in this nation than we are about the king of the kingdom. And I know I'm probably going to get persecuted for that, but it's all good, bring it. Because I would much rather be happy and, and following after my king and his kingdom than I would any president or any government or any other thing going on in this nation. I pray for him, I pray for the government, but the reality is they're not our answer. They're not the ones that are going to save us when persecution comes. It's only the king and it's only his kingdom that's going to rescue us when all hell breaks loose. Y'all wait for the rapture, but what if it don't come? So good. Y'all ain't ready for this. If I, if I start talking philosophy to you, you'd be mad at me. Because I don't think we're going to go out before tribulation comes. I think we're going to go through tribulation, and most of us ain't even ready for it. Because we think persecution happens on Facebook. Persecution happens when we begin to preach the gospel, and they throw us in prison for it. Persecution happens when they come up and beat the fool out of somebody and leave him for dead like they did Paul because he was preaching the truth and they stoned him to the point of death and left him for dead. We ain't even experienced what's getting ready to come. I think we're in a preparation phase for the next dimension of glory and the next dimension of glory brings a greater persecution that we're going to see on the church. And I, I know what's going on in California. The governor out there are already trying to tell them that you're going to go to jail if you show up at the church in person. That's just the beginning phases, y'all. He said, those that endure to the end. What's the end? He only knows. You're too busy in your rapture pants trying to get yourself out of here. And you ain't ready for nothing. I agree with what you said. Rapture pants. We, we, rapture drills. Get out now. Anyway. Rapture bus stop. Rapture, rapture bus stop. Get on the bus stop and let's go. The reality is this though. How many of us are really ready for persecution? He said it's going to come. If you love me and if you follow me, they persecute me so they're going to persecute you too. They're going to do it. It's a struggle. I believe that the reason the church isn't ready for it is because we are shallow. We only want him on the surface because it looks good. It looks pretty. But then when the depth of things begin to happen, we fall apart. And we begin to walk away from God. And we don't want to live for him anymore. The struggle just got too much for me. So, Pastor, I'm not going to make it to church next Sunday. Yeah. I can't do it. And then all of a sudden, we don't see him for... The week after that, the week after that, 
the week after that, the week after that. And then you call them and message them, what's, what's going on, man? I just, I just can't take it no more. So I'm going to sit and wallow in self-pity. Kind of like the Grinch. I'm going to wallow in self-pity. <laughs> you better stand up, people. Yeah, you better. So the reality is this. I'm getting weird. The reality is this. Our shallowness is what has been defining us for so long. But do you know that the Bible says that the deep of us should be calling out to the deep of God? And so God wants to redig the wells inside of you that have been covered up because he's getting you ready for something big that's getting ready to happen. Persecution might happen, but understand that with persecution comes multiplication of the kingdom. Every time they began to preach the gospel, persecution came, but what happened? It caused people to go after him even greater. Let me read one more scripture and then I'm going to quit. Where's it at? Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Put that up. And now, Lord, observe their threats. Take them into account and grant that your bondservants may declare your message of salvation with great confidence. Watch this. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders attesting miracles take place through the name and the authority and power of your holy servant and son, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were meeting together was shaken. And signs and a sign of God's presence. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness and with courage. You know what I believe needs to happen in this moment? I believe the church needs to wake up and stop crying about what's going on in the world. And we need to start praying and start asking God to fill us with boldness and with courage to go out and speak the word of God in power. I believe that the church needs to be shaken. I think I'm not. We the only ones? We the only ones preaching. I think the church needs to be shaken. I think it needs to be shaken to the point it wakes up that the foundation of our, of our building be, be shaken and explode with power. I, I had to come down because I can't take it no more. I'm tired and tired and tired of coming into church and living normalcy and going through the motions. I need to be shaken. I don't want to go to work anymore and just go through the process of normalcy. And just go and do my job every day. I want to go there with a word inside of me that's going to wreck somebody's life in a moment for the kingdom of God. And if I get persecuted, and if I get fired, then it's all for His glory. We're so worried about everything else. Let's be shaken today by the power and the presence of God. Let's be shook out of complacency and conformity. Let's be shook. And I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. You gotta be shook out of yourself. You gotta be shook to where the cap of your will just explodes off and he begins to pour the water of his presence inside of you. I think there's a clashing going on, like I said earlier, and I think there's a clashing going on for the for your soul. I think some of you Literally, the clashing is going on for your soul. Not only just living for him, but just wanting to come to him. There's a clashing going on. There's a battle going on within you. To say, should I straddle the fence or should I own the land? And God said he doesn't want us to straddle the fence any longer. He wants us to come into that place where we can stand with him. 